This is the SF Productions Podcast Network. Good evening and welcome to another exciting episode of Vast Wasteland. kids doing up here in the attic? Comment it went up. There's nothing to watch. <laughs> Come, Nitch. Everything's 3D Hollywood today. I remember back when I was, I was your age, we used to just uh, get our old TV set, no satellite hookups or anything, just took our signals out of the air. But wasn't that dangerous? Well, that was, of course, uh, before the uh, Surgeon General found a link between uh, TV signals and cancer. That was before your time. Remember some old 2D shows, though? Uh, some are even in black and white. Wow! Of course, that was uh, before President Turner put that enforced colorization law through in the 20s. Our show's been really boring. They weren't even interactive. Well, don't be so sure about that. There were some great shows back then. Oh, wait a minute. Let me look at this. Mm. Ooh, what? what's that? Oh, it's called a VCR. <laughs> Uh, see, back before all the video was put directly into computer memory in the comnet, people used to tape shows. Uh, let me see. Uh, oh, there's, there's a tape already in here. Let me let me hook this up here. Let me see what we got. Uh, oh, ooh, oh, damn radiation! <laughs> Come back with us to the '60s and '70s, the dwelling place of the lost generation. An era whose heroes, role models, and very lives were molded informed by weekly installments of favorite television programs. Welcome to the place your parents didn't understand. Welcome to the vast wasteland. Welcome, Welcome home. home. <laughs> Good evening, and welcome to another exciting episode of Vast Wasteland. I'm your host, Mark Smidbar, along with Wilbur Neal and Marty Wiley. We're here to talk about 60s and 70s television. Before we get into the big extravaganza of fun tonight, I just want to tell you we're on Tuesdays at 6, Wednesdays at 10, and Thursdays at 3 p.m. here on ACTV Cable 21. Also, if you want to write into us, we have a new box number. Yes, for whatever reason you want to write into us, just Write it care of Vast Wasteland, Box 15, 14, 11, Columbus, Ohio, 432, 15. And uh, we're still having that big, uh, and this is, I, I do this every every show. I can't remember the name of what we're calling this, the uh, swap, the big video swap deal. <laughs> if you uh, have a show that you can't seem to find anything about and you'd love to get a videotape of it, write to us. We'll mention on the air that you're looking for it and if somebody else has it they can write into us and we'll uh, arrange some big swap now, or if somebody not... knows where you can get it right exactly information exactly. whatnot so it's a clearing house that's the word i want a free exchange that's the word clearing house yikes a free exchange of wants and ideas exactly or wants and ideas i don't know right. so we'll uh, uh we'll set everybody up and uh and this is, of course, not for commercial use at all. No you know, money. we're not making any money on this. We want to make sure, you know, don't don't write in and say, I'll tell you if you give me five bucks. We can't do that. <laughs> we don't have any so, money. So, <laughs> we have no money. So, let's move on to tonight's topic. Certainly in uh, the 60s and 70s, especially the 70s, uh, one of the, probably the guiding force in the 70s of programming. Yeah, let's, let's even make that the late 70s. Right. <laughs> uh... Fred Silverman, 
the man with the golden gut, as he was called, because of his uncanny ability to find to take a to take a, a network with really bad shows and just put him in number one. He did it with CBS. He did it with ABC. He didn't quite do it with NBC. And so tonight it's NBC, the Silverman years. But that was ABC. NBC. NBC. He, was, he was on all of them. That's the point. That's so confusing. <laughs> now, Such a guy. <laughs> now, of course, he started out, um, actually, uh, he wrote a uh, thesis for OSU. Whoa. Yeah. He's a Buckeye, huh? Yeah, he was uh, at OSU, Figures. and he uh, wrote a thesis about um, how ABC was programming their shows in the early 50s. And somebody at CBS saw him and said, saw this thesis somehow, and they said, wow, this what guy really guy. knows what he's doing. So they brought him in as a young executive, and before you know it, he was in charge of daytime programming. Amazing. <laughs> and it's just that simple. That's Maybe right. Maybe that could that's happen that's to that, Brad. That easy really? to get. And then we could be on the network. <laughs> yeah. It's, so it's that easy to get into television, or at least it was in the 50s. So um, by the time you get to the early 60s, uh, Silverman has become the new head of uh, nighttime uh, programming, all evening programming. And uh, he's doing very well, and uh, he kind of brought in a lot of those rural shows that made him uh, made CBS such a hit at the time. It was also Mike Dan, this other programmer, but but Silverman was like this uh, trying he was all these the Silverman. Yeah, he was trying all these maverick concepts. You know, just oh, we're gonna try this uh, this counter programming, and we'll change shows around, and and. Uh, uh, lots of things that, you know, no one would uh, hear about, but uh, it seemed to work for Silverman. And before you know it, boom, uh, CBS is uh, moving into, moving into uh, like, second or first place by that point. Uh, they w were really doing bad. He brought in shows like All in the Family and MASH. I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> he really had some great ideas. You know, he, he said, you know, we're going to change the rural outlook. So uh, right at the point when CBS is just roaring along, uh, Silverman leaves because he doesn't think he has enough big enough challenge. So he leaves, goes to ABC, which at this point is doing garbage. They're they're third. They're in the hole. This is early 70s, and he came in and he said, "Well, we've got to get to uh, kind of like a, a consciousness between all the shows." So there was a lot of crossovers on shows, a lot of spectaculars, and a lot of <laughs> <laughs> lots of glitzy stuff and a lot of counter programming. This man brought up the concept of the second season uh, before <laughs> you know, like the you know, before there, were, you basically, if a show went on the air, it was like on for 26 weeks, whether it was good or not. <laughs> September shows, May. Shows were not canceled until like the end of the season. And he went back and he, looked at the reviews and said, "Let's get rid of it. Right. Or let's keep it." Right. And, and we'll show reruns over the summer, and we'll start a new right. season in the fall. <laughs> And all of a sudden, he comes in and says, "No, no, we're gonna we're gonna trash all these shows that aren't doing any good." In fact. Um, at one point, uh, I read that ABC, by 1975, had no programming on its uh, primetime programming that had been on before 1973. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> everything <Rosa>. was gone. <laughs> Clean slate. <it. laughs> Boom, everything's gone. It's all new. It's <laughs> all for you. <laughs> new and improved. And so ABC became the, the network of happy days, and, and uh, Silverman became Mr. Spinoff with Laverne and Shirley and, and things like Mork and Mork Mindy. Mork and Mindy and, is a spinoff of right, happy days. Right. Yeah. Uh, and brought in shows like Welcome Back, Cotter. And <laughs> An so, excellent show. Oh, yeah. And so he's just roaring along, and everything's going great, and he hits the, the uh, 76 Olympics. <laughs> And it's a huge hit, and Olympics until that point had never done well at the networks, and so no one paid any money for him. So um, he goes in there, big hit, and because it's a big hit, a lot of people see all these promos for new shows, which catapults them in the number one place, the first time ABC had ever been number one. And uh, he just rolled on into Roots. <laughs> I mean, it, it, you can just go through and just... Uh, uh, like a hall of fame of, of 70 shows, especially at ABC, that is, boom, show, show, great show, great show, great show, great show. Now, a lot of the, a lot of the things they did, you know, like Three's Company. Bubblegum shows, a lot of bubblegum shows. A lot of bubblegum shows, Charlie's Angels, stuff like that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Not exactly your upper crust programming. 
So, um, but popular. Right. You know, Enormously nothing, popular. nothing for the brain, really. Right. Just, just lots of eye bubble gum. Yeah. Lots of, <laughs> lots of jiggle. Lots of, <laughs> lots of the same thing, but. Right. People get comfortable with stuff. Over and over and <laughs> over again. <laughs> see how many situations That's we can right. create. Oh, with gee, the John same Ritter has gone. Thing. John Ritter has. I mean, you think John Ritter was three's company? Yeah, he was the and show. And now basically. he's like getting like famous. <laughs> yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Like he's like a real actor now. He can mm. tell he's a real actor because he does promotional commercials for <laughs> items that you wouldn't ordinarily buy. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> like he's actually done a movie or so, eh? Yeah. He's done a couple movies like, uh, well, what's, what was that? Uh, what was he that did, one? Well, he did that Hooperman series. That yeah. was a good, that was a good dramedies. series. Yeah. That was a good series. That was really good. Yeah, he's done movies and stuff. Yeah, he's what was that long. Blake Edwards movie? Oh, it's that, uh, Skin, the one that Skin Deep. Skin, Skin Deep, yeah. Yeah, which I thought was really... You know, you think Skin Deep, which was really a pretty much successful movie, and then Three's Company. <laughs> oh, he traveled. <laughs> yeah, quite a ways there. Hey, so, what's happened to Suzanne Summers besides uh, we bedwetting? <laughs> yeah. well, we don't know. Bedwetting and childhood alcoholism. <laughs> well, she was, was she uh, like a police, uh, police captain or something? Well, some yeah, she, she's show? the sheriff. Yeah, okay. Went on that. That was a weird concept. NBC tried to do the idea of we're going to move back, move prime time back to 7:30. Mm. Now this is something that most uh, affiliates didn't see because uh, I saw it because uh, the affiliate, NBC affiliate in Cleveland, was a what do they refer to as an O and O station, owned and operated. NBC owned it, and so all the owned the O and O stations were forced to show this. Uh, these five nights of sitcoms starting at 7.30 with NBC shows. Mm. And no, none of the other affiliates did because... I thought it was because syndicated because stuff. <laughs> it, it was later. But, okay. but at the beginning, they tried to push it as NBC shows, and of course, the only people that did it were the, were the uh, own stations because all the other ones said, hey, we got Crosswits or, uh, you know, <laughs> Wheel of Dude, Fortune or Fortune. Jeopardy or <laughs> Entertainment Tonight or whatever. <laughs> and we're making big bucks with those. We're not going to give another half hour to the network. So that idea died. News. They went on to syndication. <laughs> so she went on to syndication heaven with the... Uh, <laughs> Joyce DeWitt's gone nowhere. <laughs> wait, wait. Boy, she just, boom, she was gone. A vapor. <laughs> and I think she lasted longer on the show as the originals. Oh, yeah. Of any yeah. of the originals. Well, her and, her and John Ritter were basically the, yeah. the, yeah, only, he stayed on the only ones that stayed the whole time. Of course, the Ropers. The Ropers got their own show. <laughs> the Ropers, they're gone. And, of course, Mr. Furley, the immortal Don Knotts, moved in. <laughs> yeah, that darn Don Knotts. <laughs> My golly. Doing his Barney uh, Fife impression again. Just gonna <laughs> oh, can you do somebody else? Tell me. <laughs> yeah. Barney Fife with an Apache scarf. He does Barney Fife. <laughs> He made Barney Fife what Barney Fife is, <laughs> a legend in his own mind. That's right. <laughs> so uh, certainly they, they just moved along with huge, enormous hits. And then again, Silverman said, oh, I've, I don't have a challenge anymore. ABC is so dominant over the other two networks that I must go somewhere else. So he went to number three, which by that point was the is extremely beleaguered NBC. <laughs> Which by that point it was just doing horribly. And what <laughs> magic did he bestow upon them? Well, <laughs> she tried to say things didn't go as well at NBC as it had for the others. I think basically by this point he was he had a, just he had to have an enormous ego because it's like he had taken you know he was he was about to pull the hat trick of broadcasting, <laughs> bring all three networks from number three to number one, and he's like yeah this is I'm in the home stretch now. Uh, this will be easy. I'll just, I'll just whip up some magic and boom, NBC will be number one. Just breeze right through. And, <laughs> and so I think what happened basically between his ego and the fact that nobody else at NBC, at least at the beginning, was saying, well, Fred, isn't this a silly idea? Because he's Fred Silverman. He must know what he's doing. <laughs> so, so when, when he brings up concepts like we're going to have a nuclear-powered train and we're going to pay $10 million for sets at a time when NBC was in the red. Uh, nobody said, Fred, uh, can't we kind of do it with a bus or something? Uh, <laughs> kind of alter this? Wouldn't it be nice to have that kind of power? Yeah. Walk into a TV station and just... And that's what he did. 
say the law. <laughs> he did. And, um, and he just run, ran into <laughs> well, fiascos o plenty. <laughs> it's just like one after another. <laughs> boom, boom, boom. Boom. <laughs> Uh, starting with, uh, well, these aren't these aren't in uh, chronological order, but just uh, going along, uh, big hit. Grandpa goes to Washington. <laughs> <laughs> what a great 15 idea! Fifteen weeks. <laughs> uh, September seventh to January sixteenth. Pretty about much thirteen, 13 weeks. weeks. <laughs> Jack Albertson uh, played a crotchety old. Uh, oh, what a stretch! <laughs> <laughs> what a stretch! <laughs> He played this grandpa who decides oh, who I'm gonna be thought? I'm gonna be a senator. So he runs for the Senate and he gets elected. <laughs> and it's all this, you know, it's kinda like Isn't a and obviously it's a it's a Mr. Smith goes to Washington kind of thing. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's lots of well, he's the only honest guy, and everybody else are and uh, and it's really amazing when you look at the look at the uh, the uh, supporting cast. Featuring Larry Linville. Larry Linville. <laughs> Straight from Straight Nash. Straight from Frank Burns. Uh, he went on as Major General Kevin Kelly. Got a promotion up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You, based on how old they made him, you almost think, oh, this could be Frank Burns, like, by the 1970s. <laughs> it really could. Because huh. they kind of grade him up and, you know, and uh -huh. made him older. and Maybe. So, uh, let's see. They have him listed here as... The bland, empty-headed Air Force General. <laughs> Gee, the Frank bland, empty-headed uh, Army doctor. My son, the fathead. <laughs> <laughs> and you can really see Jack Albertson sitting there saying that. Charlie! <laughs> oh, um, <Chico>. Kevin! <laughs> <laughs> burp, Charlie, burp! <laughs> Attaboy! <laughs> and, Gee, and, has Jack Albertson, like, always been old? He seems to have been. It's like he John Houston. From birth. Okay. There's one of those people like John Houston. John Houston and John Kerry. Hey, get away from me. <laughs> Run in on I'm, me. I'm being born. Get away from me. I'm old already. <laughs> he had gray hair and wrinkles when he was born. And a mustache. <laughs> and a mustache. <laughs> Scary. So then we move on to certainly the, the, uh, the archetype for bad Silverman shows. <laughs> Hello, Larry! <laughs> With another MASH. Uh, With another MASH regular. For yeah. some reason, he kept reaching in the old MASH Poor regular. McLean Stevenson. Well, McLean Stevenson actually has enough bad shows that basically rate his own show pretty much. For <laughs> bad shows that <laughs> McLean Stevenson has something to do. And it's like, and, and uh, this was basically every cliche that they could find <laughs> wrapped up into a show. You know, you had the... The swinging uh, widow guy. Bachelor dad. Bachelor yeah. widow. Had, what, was a widow? Or widow. no, no. He was divorced. No breakup. Oh, no, he was. He was divorced. Didn't he have kids? Oh yeah. Yeah. Had two kids. Of course, went with him. <laughs> Sounds like every other show on yeah. today. <laughs> yeah. It was like one day at a time there, and then and then he's on a uh, radio station like WKRP, and yeah. then. <laughs> uh oh, I see they've got another one of these great. Let's change the character, the person that plays the character, and maybe nobody will notice kind of deals here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Diane Alder, played by Donna Wilkes, and then Krista Erickson. <laughs> and no one... And no one noticed. No one watching. <laughs> and she's but got she a little didn't. sister. No I'm sure her little watching. sister never even noticed either. <laughs> and this was another, this was another a Silverman concept that, uh, in this show that, never, that didn't work in this case, which was... Well, we'll kind of pump some blood into this show by uh, kind of an emergency transfusion by, we'll bring a hit show coming in, which of course was Different Strokes, and we find out that <laughs> these two guys were old army buddies, and so, yeah, and so there was lots of cross-pollination, they were, they were right next to each other for a long time mm -hmm. on the schedule, and they'd be on one show, and they'd be on the other show, and it didn't work. Every time it was like, people would say, hey, Different Strokes is on, they'd watch that, and as soon as Hello Larry... Boom, they're gone. <laughs> Different strokes when the kids were cute. Right. <laughs> or they all turned Committed to crime. Committed felonies. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's like a show in itself, though. By golly. Of course, they've done all the talk shows. Right. So. And, and finally, <laughs> and finally, the what I consider the, the final cliche. Oh, hey, wait a minute. Let's, when, when, no, no, I mean for the show. I'm the okay. same show. <laughs> okay. The, the final cliche. If a show's dying, bring in a real sports figure. 
<laughs> as, as a new character. Um, yes, they brought in Metal, Metal Like Lemon as himself. himself. <laughs> what a stretch. <laughs> and he just happened to move in the same apartment building that that the other one's in. Bouncing basketballs up and down the <laughs> yeah. all hours of the hey, night, you know. Then <laughs> so, I'm on his finger. But it was just wasn't enough to save the show. Well, no. <laughs> they pulled out all the Willis. stops. <laughs> And then, you know, when everyone was trying to do those, those uh, uh, the Western kind of country shows, Dukes of Hazard and stuff like that, well, they said, you know, uh, we've got this BJ and the Bear that's doing pretty well. There's this character. He would be great on his own show. Yes, it's the misadventures of Sheriff Lobo. Sheriff Lobo. <laughs> I used to watch that one because I like Perkins. Perkins was on there. Rod Akins, and certainly one of his worst roles <laughs> Well, he was. It was. It was pretty much the way I look. It was looked like Andy Griffith to me. <laughs> but I mean, Andy Griffith had had some some semblance of uh, sanity to it. This was this just is complete slapstick. Like we're <laughs> we're trying to be Andy Griffith, but we we just don't have you that much John talent. Knott. Right. <laughs> yes. John Knox was too busy doing Three's Company. Well, that's why they had this fella here, Mill Mills Watson, who played Deputy Perkins. Now he was the show. <laughs> Uh, in my opinion. Amazing he didn't get spun, spun off into his own show. I almost thought well, he would have. Because you look at that other, what was, uh, the, well, Duke's a Hazard, and then they spun off Enos. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Which went by other names, but. <laughs> right. So, so there was that show. And look here, Nell Carter was in the cast of that show. Oh. Right? Wow. Oh, that Lobo. I remember she and Perkins used to always get into arguments about things. Because she'd tell him how stupid he was, and he wouldn't believe her. And then he'd, he'd go out and prove to the rest of the, the viewing audience how stupid he was. That's right. <laughs> and Lobo would have to come in and save the day. Yeah, that was fun. So then we move on to, to certainly, possibly the worst concept of any television show, oh, I'd say ever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going forever here, I, huh? I think, I think, I don't think anyone will come up with a worse concept. I'm saying, you know... That's, I would your be hard that's your challenge. That's your challenge. Is we come up with the worst concept. Future programmers of America come up with the worst concept than Pink Lady and Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> for those who don't remember this show, and most people don't because it was on for such a short time. No, we have mentioned it before, though. Yes, but we have. This time, pay attention. Right. <laughs> yeah, we were paying attention last. So time. it won't happen okay. again. <laughs> we, no, we never have to mention it again. Jeff Altman, who's now a fairly funny comedian, but at the time was a fairly up and Vegas coming coming comedian. comedian yeah. Wore tuxes a lot and. So, he put him together with this hot new Japanese rock uh, duo, Pink Lady. And it was these two Japanese women, and they had a huge hit in Japan. Mei uh, Nimoto and Kei Masuda. Yeah. <laughs> and they look great, and they, they put them in, you know, like sexy outfits, and oh, and they're going to have Banner, it'll be like Sonny and Cher kind of thing. They it'll be like Tony Banner, Orlando and Dawn. Or Tony Orlando yeah, and Dawn. So you can do both of those at once. For. But there was the one slight problem. They no, didn't they speak mean, a English. whit of English. Not at all. No, so, not a bit. <laughs> all the witty banner, they spoke phonetically. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Which really yeah. screws up your timing. <laughs> and so, so they get the one who's the oh, nice, yeah. the nice little, the nice little sweet one, and the other one's trying to be the mean one. Yeah. <laughs> and so in order to make her mean, they she, don't know it. <laughs> in order to make her mean, what do they do? They tell her to lower her voice yeah. a couple of octaves. <laughs> so she's talking like, sound like Toshiro Mifune. What it? What it? <laughs> like a bad kung fu movie. It's exactly. All That's what the show needed, some kung fu, yeah. <laughs> that would have helped it, actually. <laughs> Could have helped. Really scary that this show ever got on the air. And again, an, an example of, of nobody sat there and said, uh, Mr. Zilverman, uh, Excuse me. there's a slight problem oh, here. Could we possibly get somebody who could speak English? Well, apparently <laughs> somebody did because it was on from May the 1st, 1980 until April 4th but of 1980. But this show should never have hit the huh? air. It this was show. on for exactly one month. Did yeah. you say May to April? No, no, no. Okay, March, March excuse March me. To April. March the 1st to okay, April I, I the 4th. Okay, I didn't know the time was going backwards or Okay, well, maybe, maybe I said it wrong, but okay, it was on for maybe one month. Maybe you said wrong. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we oh, hold up two yeah. times. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> I corrected that. doing this all phonetically. <laughs> so, another example of why did this show get on the air? But... Here's here's one of my favorite show, <laughs> Super Train. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Let me set the stage for you for Super Train. Love Boat, big hit on ABC. In fact, something that uh, Silverman had something to do with when they started getting together. 
So he comes over and he says, hey, what a great idea. Lots of people getting falling in love on some form of transportation. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we can't uh, do a, a large form of transportation. Now, also, about the time between there somewhere, there was the movie The Big Bus. Yes. Which was out. And so, it was um, a satire. It, exactly. It was a satire on the idea of people meeting, falling in love, situations happening on a large um, sort <laughs> of <power> transportation, <laughs> whatever it is. Because at the same, it was making fun of the airplane movies, no, the airport, no, airport, 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 airport movies, airport, 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 which um, airplane. were out, Right. Airport well, had been out. The they they had gone through maybe three or four of them right. at the time. And so then they came up with the big bus, which is a takeoff on those. But at the same time on TV, we've got the love boat, which is, which is coming out. And it's kind of a decent kind of show, you know? Yeah. And so, <laughs> And then they go on and so, so, then he gets the idea, well, let's see what's working here. We've got... Large form of transportation. Uh, large form of transportation. Nuclear power. Nuclear power. And the people meeting. Okay, so we've got to make... And, and we've got to have a, a wacky crew. A wacky, and wacky like crew. A boat. A bar. And a get bar. a bar. And, and we have to have a disco. Yeah. Well, let's see. What form of transportation could do that? Well, we can't use a boat. Uh, a train! A train! <laughs> Not just any train. <laughs> an enormous nuclear-powered train that would go back and forth across America 200 miles an hour. So now, I guess that nuclear power is safe. That's right. <laughs> so, of course... <laughs> that was a uh, comedy. They had, they had... But it wasn't. That was the worst part. <laughs> so, of course, since they couldn't have this enormous train actually going across America, they had to build miniatures. Lots of miniatures. Ten million dollars worth of miniatures. <laughs> <laughs> at a time, a good year for the miniature makers. <laughs> at a time that NBC was like out of money, they were in the red. They were like affiliates dropping off left and right. Silverman comes in and says, "I want to spend ten million dollars on miniatures for a show that's a complete ripoff and probably won't be on that long." And they went, "Okay." <laughs> so, boom! Well, I'm, I'm sure he had to sell like, "Come on, this will be. This is the big one. I can feel." Oh it. yeah, this is the one. <laughs> so he does. So he does this series. It's on for a month. And then, boom, it's off again because the ratings are absolutely hideous. And they retool it, get rid of all but one of the cast members, <laughs> and then put it back on for a couple months. And it still doesn't work. And so it's gone. Yet another huge fiasco from Fred Silverman. <laughs> and uh, let's see, I want to just, let's see, mention, oh, one more turnabout. <laughs> oh, no. This, this is fun. Turnabout, John Chuck. Sharon Glass, actually two fairly good actors. Why the heck they're in? Well, maybe not John Chuck, but <laughs> Sharon Glass. Sharon Glass is two very good quality. actors, That's except quality. for John Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> Sharon Glass, fine actress. How she was roped into this beyond me. This well, man and work. wife uh, secretly want to have the other's life. Uh, she wants to be a man and have, make all the decisions and have this powerful job, and he just wants to get out of the out of the rat race and have her lovely job or whatever, and they find this totem or whatever, <laughs> and boom, their souls are moved back and forth, and so suddenly his soul is in her body and her soul is in his body. This has been done over and over, but never as a series because it's such a limited concept. Exactly. <laughs> and so where can we go boom. from here? It's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of two-hour movies about this, but you can't really do a series on it. Well, it lasted so. for a good two months. <laughs> That's right. What's that, eight weeks? <laughs> uh, so, anyways, uh, one last thing I just wanted to... Oh, actually, we're almost desperately out of time. <laughs> Believe it or not. Oh, but anyways, so Fred Silverman basically got up to the 1980 Olympics, which he was convinced was going to really... He was going to build up to the big thing. By the end of 1980, they were going to be number one, and of course... We boycotted the Moscow Olympics, and boom, he couldn't show the Olympics. NBC lost fifty million dollars, <laughs> and by that point, he's a ghost. Oh! Bye, bye, Fred. <laughs> yeah, bye, bye, Fred, and bye, bye for the show because we're out of here. Next time at Vast Wasteland, uh, it's our rerun of our big Trek show. It's Vast Wasteland from the vault. <laughs> so, <laughs> vintage, we, vast vintage Vast. Wasteland. So, we'll see you next time. Well, we won't, but you will. Good night.